The label metaphysical was applied retrospectively by Dr. Johnson to a definer group of early 17th century poets. Dunn, Herbert, Vaughan, Marvel, Carey and Crasher were among those who formed this diverse group. Johnson deplored metaphysical or strong-lined poetry. He judged that displays of ingenuity detracted from the emotional power of a poem. The term metaphysical is a vague classification which obscures the individuality of the poets. In reality, although the metaphysical poets demonstrate some common themes, their work is clearly distinguished by differences of treatment and emphasis. They are um, alike in dealing with themes in an argumentative way rather than making flat statements. They debate with themselves or the reader, they use wit a great deal, and they are keen to see unexpected likenesses between objects or situations. In fact, I think I would say that relationships is the theme that they have in common, but they focus on different kinds of relationships, each of them. Uh, Crashaw, who became a Roman Catholic, is, writes almost entirely religious poetry, which again is the human being and worship. Though becoming a Catholic, he brings the Virgin Mary into many of his poems. George Herbert, who became a, a parish priest, is much more focused on the relationship of the human individual with God. And he also explores the place of worship and prayer within that relationship. Um, Carey is less metaphysical anyway, and his concerns are simply love and not very much detail. Henry Vaughan is interesting because uh, he imitates Herbert quite a lot, but he's also interested in something called hermetic philosophy, which looks at the idea of God being present in all nature, not simply being its creator. Marvell is um, more widely ranging, that he, he deals with human love, he deals with state affairs and the relationship of the individual's beliefs with their state practices. So that brings another relationship in. Literature does not exist in isolation. It is shaped by social and cultural change. The style of poetry that emerged in the early 17th century was a response to the spirit of the age. In a period when many traditions were being challenged, new patterns of thought and feeling formed. Scientific advances had challenged established ideas about the Earth's place in the universe. A mood of anxiety, created as old certainties faded, was heightened by divisive religious and political upheavals. These changes threatened the status quo and the concept of the divine right of kings. The early years of the 17th century lay between two major upheavals in English society, the Reformation and the Civil War. These cataclysmic events were part of the process of transition which transformed society from medieval to modern. Then there was the increasing impact of new discoveries, both geographical discoveries from across the world and ideas on the structure of the universe. The old ideas of the Ptolemaic universe, which saw the Earth as the centre, was now generally known to have been replaced by Copernicus's theories that the Sun was the centre of the universe. And this was such a shocking idea that people reacted as if the universe had actually been reorganised, not merely we had a different theory about it. So it could be used as an image of dissolution, of destruction, and there was much talk of the coming of the end of the world, partly as a result of that. So it's a very exciting period to live in, and all these influences and pressures are there in the poetry. The metaphysical poets shared more than simply the strong lines that Johnson identified as part of their defining style. The common experience of life in an age of change shaped their work. Metaphysical poetry deals most frequently with issues central to this uncertain world. Although love, in its many forms, is a major theme, the poets also address the progress of the soul, religion and the state. 
One poem which comments on the political condition of society is Marvel's Horatian Ode, written upon Cromwell's return from Ireland. This is a contemporary testament to the age and reflects the circles in which Marvel moved. The poem was written in praise of Cromwell. Much to the man is due, who from his private gardens, where he lived reserved and austere, could by industrious valour climb to ruin the great work of time and cast the kingdom old into another mould. The metaphysical poets enjoyed a privileged social standing. This enabled them to write from a desire to entertain rather than from the need to be published. Involvement with the court and the intelligentsia of the day inspired both a wit and a word play calculated to appeal to a social elite. One of the characteristic literary devices used by the metaphysical poets is the conceit. This is a piece of imagery which unites disparate objects and sustains their apparent likeness throughout the poem. Dunn's poem, A Valediction Forbidding Morning, is the source of one particularly well-known conceit, the comparison of lovers to a pair of compasses. If they be two, they are two so as stiff twin compasses are two. Thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. The conceit probably may best be illustrated if we imagine um, the kind of compass we use at school, although Dunn most certainly had a different kind of compass in mind, namely the compass that was used on a ship. The fixed foot um, is likened to the mistress who stays at home. Then the foot who moves and draws the circle is the lover when he's absent from his mistress, so when he is on a journey, for instance. Um, but as the fixed foot accommodates um, the movement of the foot that moves. Um, so the mistress's soul hearkens after the lover's soul when he's absent, which basically means the lovers are never really completely separated, but um, their, their union is complete even when they are apart from each other. Dunn is the most renowned of the metaphysical poets. His poetry is memorable for its wide-ranging exploration of love in its various forms be that divine, sexual, or platonic. Dunn conveys the intimate world of complete sexual love in The Good Morrow. And now, good morrow to our waking souls, which watch not one another out of fear, for love, all love of other sights controls, and makes one little room and everywhere. Let sea discoverers to new worlds have gone, let maps to others, worlds on worlds have shown. Let us possess one world, each hath one and is one. Dunn's treatment of love is complex and varied. He interlinks different forms of love. Religious and sexual love in particular are blended in his poetry. Lovers become spiritual figures as their relationship rises from the physical. In his poem, The Canonization, in comparing the lover's unchanging passion to religious truths, Dunn elevates them to a saint-like status. We can die by it, if not live by love. And if unfit for tombs and hearse our legend be, it will be fit for verse. And if no piece of chronicle we prove, we'll build in sonnets pretty rooms. As well a well-wrought urn becomes the greatest ashes, as half-acre tombs, and by these hymns, all shall approve us canonized for love. Dunn, for example, in talking of a happy relationship between two people, will draw into that references to, to science, to geography, to Platonic theo philosophy, a whole range of ideas, so that love becomes an expression of existence, not merely an expression of itself so that you feel you're being drawn into a very wide experience, and yet, while you're still focusing on a single couple. Spirituality moves human love away from physicality towards the platonic. In his poem, The Undertaking, Dunn claimed to have written of a spiritual love free from all sensual desire. If, as I have, you also do virtue attired in woman see, 
and dare love that, and say so too, and forget the he and she. And if this love, though placed so, from profane men you hide, which will no faith on this bestow, or if they do deride, then you have done a braver thing than all the worthies did. When in his portrayal of platonic love, Dunn tells us to forget the he and she, we are still made aware of sexual love. Even references to its absence raise sexuality as an issue. In Dunn's work, platonic love, in its true sense, is to be found in the affectionate verse letters which he wrote to friends. Uh, platonic love can mean a variety of things. At its most basic level, it means that there's a union of the lovers which goes beyond the union of the bodies, i.e. there's a union of souls. Um, at its most profound level, platonic love transcends the body and uh, moves on to a kind of divine love, as Bembo states in Castiglione's The Book of the Courtier. Uh, the lover is supposed to look at the mistress's soul as much as he looks at her body. Now, Dunn uses these ideas in, in different ways, depending on which poems we're looking at. He sometimes uses ideas of platonic love in conjunction with ideas of sexual love. For example, in poems which celebrate a happy union between a man and a woman, he moves beyond the idea of this being purely a physical relationship to it being a union of souls. And there is a poem called The Ecstasy, where he envisages the lovers lying together on a bank and becoming so, so absorbed into each other that their souls in a sense, leave their bodies and negotiate directly with each other. And at the end of the poem, he says, we have to return to our bodies because we are a mixture of body and soul, but anybody watching us will see no difference. He can also deal with platonic love in the sense of friendship, of a love which needs no, doesn't go as far as any sexual contact. He wrote many verse letters to his patrons, the Countess of Huntingdon, Lady Bedford, and others, and to male friends, which express a very deep affection and talk of their, their souls and their characters being in harmony. So I think one would regard that also as platonic love. The early 17th century was a period marked by controversy, religious, political and scientific debates challenged existing concepts about the earth and human society. It was an age of paradox, both disturbing and stimulating. The century opened with the accession of the first Stuart King, James I. His insistence that Dunn would make a great Anglican preacher was to shape Dunn's life. Born a Roman Catholic, Dunn had endured anti-Catholic prejudice he renounced Catholicism and was eventually persuaded to take holy orders in the Anglican Church, becoming an eminent preacher. Given his personal history, it is not surprising that Dunn's poetry addressed issues of both state and religion. Seek true religion. Aware. Oh, Mireus, thinking her unhoused here and fled from us, seeks her at Rome. There, because he doth know that she was there a thousand years ago. He loves her rags so, as we here obey the state cloth where the prince sat yesterday. Grants to such brave loves will not be enthralled, but loves her only, who at Geneva is called religion, plain, simple, sullen, young, contemptuous, yet unhandsome. In his third satire, Dunn confronts the religious turmoil of the age. By encouraging a search for the true religion, he charts the progression of religious practice. The poem moves from the history of the Catholic Church founded in Rome to the emergence of Calvinism with its northern European roots. This journey mirrors Dunn's personal religious progression. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries from History Hit and uncover the secrets of some of the most famous people and events in history. History Hit gives you access to a growing range of documentaries presented by and featuring 
historians at the forefront of research and debate. Whether you are looking to find out more about charismatic leaders like Cleopatra or to discover the story behind the Industrial Revolution, History Hit will have something for you. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Absolute History fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. Having been brought up as a Roman Catholic and then becoming an Anglican with a emphasis on a Calvinist attitude, I think he found this a very tense area. The Calvinist idea was that you were predestined for salvation or not, and the individual was supposed to strive hard to be good in order to discover which fate was meted out to them. I think it's a very uncomfortable belief, and Dunn seems to have agonised over his relationship to God if we take the poems personally, which I think we often should. His poems do not concentrate simply on the outward manifestation of faith. They also address the progress of his own soul and express doubts about his relationship with God. These are most clearly seen in his divine poems. O oh God, O oh of thine only worthy blood and my tears make a heavenly Lethean flood and drown in it my sin's black memory. That thou remember them, some claim as debt, I think it mercy, if thou wilt forget. In the Divine Meditations, um, we find a period of Dunn's um, reflection on his own sinfulness and um, on his need for salvation. Now, Dunn, however, is never self-effacing, not even in these poems. He's constantly at the center of his own attention. Um, the only constant habit he can discover in himself is that he's, in fact, inconstant. A gentler, contemplative mood is evident in Good Friday, 1613, riding westward. Dunn's poetic argument finds its resolution in his acknowledgement of God's grace. It is this which enables the poet to turn his face to the east, towards the place of the crucifixion. Restore thine image so much by thy grace that thou mayst know me, and I'll turn my face. As the source of imagery, it is extremely powerful in his poetry. Many of his love poems addressed to women speak of their love as if it were a religion. In the canonization, for example, he sets himself and the woman up as uh, deities almost to be worshipped by other earthly lovers and to be regarded as a model of how to behave. Um, elsewhere, he uses frequently imagery to do with religion. He speaks of the, the body of the lover as being a temple in which they will worship. In what was undoubtedly a golden age for drama, it is not surprising that Dunn's poetry reflects the influences of those dramatists who were his contemporaries. Shakespeare, Webster and Spencer were all writing in this period. The style of Dunn's poetic voice is allied to the dramatic language of these playwrights. Many of his poems have startling and dramatic openings that immediately involve the reader. For God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love or chide my palsy or my gout. I do not think melodramatic is an appropriate term to attach to Dunn. He exaggerates sometimes, but to me melodrama suggests emotion or excitement in excess of the situation being described. What I would say though is he is a very dramatic poet, and this isn't surprising since he lived and wrote when drama in England was at one of its great peaks and he was recorded as being a great visitor of the theatre. So it would not be surprising if drama is in his poetry. It manifests itself in a number of ways. Many of the lyrics set up a situation very economically so that as you read, you envisage people in a particular place going through a particular set of events and it is therefore like watching a little drama rather than reading a meditative poem. The conversational quality of the dialogue and the powerful imagery which permeates much of Dunn's work 
takes us beyond the confines of the poem. The reader is able to envisage the action being played out. In his poem, The Flea, Dunn creates a whole scene from a conversation in which he attempts to prevent his lover killing a flea. Oh, stay, three lives in one flea spare, where we almost, nay, more than married are. This flea is you and I, and this our marriage bed and marriage temple is. The poem is ultimately about um, the narrator trying to persuade his mistress to sleep with him. Um, the first stanza centers on the flea. In the second stanza, the mistress is threatening the flea. And in the third stanza, stanza the flea is squashed by the mistress. Now, the narrator tries to plead for the life of the flea and rebukes his mistress for killing the animal. Um, the mistress is never allowed to speak but we can gather her words and actions from um, the narrator's words. So um, a little drama evolves here um, within the poem, and it's really not uh, a simple soliloquy or monologue, um, but a well-constructed drama. In Dunn's The Apparition, there is a strong sense of the theatrical. The poet imagines his ghost visiting his unfaithful mistress. The description is so vivid that we imagine her lying shaking in her bed. And then poor Aspen wretch, neglected thou, bathed in a cold quicksilver sweat, wilt lie. Other ways in which he is dramatic are his use of colloquialisms, his use of speech rhythms dominating the uh, poetic meters of the poem, and there is this strong conversational voice and a sense almost of a conversation has been going on, and when the poem starts, we merely join a pre-existing situation. Dunn's poetry is dramatic and powerful. It presents us with strong views on love and sex. The reader may find difficulty with the fact that these views seem to differ wildly. In The Sun Rising, the poet makes a declaration of an all-consuming and respectful love. She is all states and all princes I, nothing else is. This view of woman is strongly contrasted with the derisive sexual imagery of a poem like Love's Alchemy, which denigrates women. Some that have deeper digged love's mind than I, say where his centric happiness doth lie. Hope not for mind in women, at best sweetness and wit, they are but mummy possessed. The question of inconsistencies in the poetry of the metaphysicals is, is a difficult one. I think modern readers find it difficult because we tend to assume that poets are necessarily being sincere and personal in what they say. And for the Renaissance period, this would have been a very alien concept. So they're very ready to say things for effect, not because they necessarily believe them. So the inconsistencies, I think, are surprises of the linkage between ideas and changes of attitude from one poem to another. So we should beware always of regarding these poets as speaking from their own personal heart. They're speaking from where they choose to stand at that moment. The early 17th century was an age which created a new framework of ideas about man, society and nature. Although Dunn was not a philosopher, his poetry explores the issues which dominated the years in which he wrote. His poetic style of debate was a perfect vehicle for his pursuit of resolutions to disturbing issues. Dunn's vigorous and unexpected imagery created a style of writing which ensured that he was not restricted by his chosen theme. There is a startling paradox in his religious poem, Holy Sonnet, Batter My Heart, when Dunn shows chastity and rape coexisting. Batter my heart, three-personed God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend. Take me to you, imprison me, for I, except you enthrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. The contrast between this powerful imagery and the calm, rational discussion of faith in Satire 3 is evidence of the sheer variety of Dunn's work. 
doubt wisely. In a strange way, to stand inquiring right is not to stray. To sleep or run, wrong is. On a huge hill, cragged and steep, truth stands, and he that will reach her about must and about must go. And what the hill's suddenness resists, win so. Dunn's philosophy affects his style very clearly. When we say Dunn's philosophy, we must beware of regarding him as a philosopher. He is a man full of ideas, and they are ideas which are contradictory, in a state of flux, and which themselves involve paradox and contrasts or relationships. What is the connection between transience and permanence, between the body and the soul? So because he is seeking after resolutions in his poems, his poems tend to be constructed very much as a debate, as a persuasive debate. So the words that tend to get stressed often in a line are the connectives like yet, if, so, that, rather than the nouns or the adjectives. And sometimes adjectives are quite sparingly used. He was excited by ideas, so his intellectual discussions in his poems are full of emotion. He feels the arguments. He doesn't deal with them in a cold, intellectual way. During the 18th and 19th centuries, the work of the metaphysical poets became unfashionable. Their reputation was revived in the early 20th century. An ingenious use of ideas and language, as well as their ability to sustain a close line of argument, appealed to modern poets. The ability of the metaphysical poets to express the experience of loving links them to poetry throughout the centuries. Human love is an enduring theme. What distinguishes the treatment of love by the metaphysical poets is its use as an overarching theme within which they addressed the major issues of their age. If Dunn is describing a love relationship, he will bring in references to old and new cosmologies, to the state, to the behavior of precious metals, or many other things, as he says, making this one room an everywhere. The whole world is contained in this experience. And that, in a sense, echoes the experience of lovers sometimes. They feel what they are experiencing is more important and includes everything in life. And Dunn can express that in his poems. The other particular quality is their readiness to play with ideas and with language so that uh, you you recognize their cleverness, the sharpness with which they can make you appreciate a point they wish to make, but also that ideas are fun. They don't have to be taken solemnly. They may be taken seriously sometimes, but you can enjoy them too. And beyond that is their skill with language, the fun they have with words. And I think a desirable effect of any poet is that they should make us enjoy words. And so, for those reasons, I think the metaphysicals are great and should go on being read. Mm -hmm.